Okay. <clears throat> Let's actually have a little bit of discussion here um, in regard to your papers, okay? Um, I, I just want to get a show of hands here. Obviously, your hands aren't on camera here. How many people think that the message of the kingdom is taught in Acts chapter 2? Okay? Anybody that thinks that the message is not taught in chapter 2? Okay. This is good. Because it means you did not fall prey to the word-concept fallacy. The word-concept fallacy is to think that the concept only shows up whenever I see the word. Thinking the kingdom is only discussed whenever I see the words kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Okay? You, you know that... Uh, that concepts can show up even when the lexical word is not present, okay? So, um, anybody want to give, in 15 seconds, their evidence as to why they think the kingdom is taught in this passage? Go ahead. Well, he's, what we ever discussed, he talked about the outpouring of the Spirit, which is already attributed to the last days or okay. the coming kingdom. Okay. And also in verse 24, where he says that God raised him up again put an end to the agony of death. Okay. Because there's kind of this feel that resurrection is to come to the like end of death in itself, which would be a kingdom concept. Interesting, yeah. Now you have to be careful there because Jesus made a very clear differentiation in chapter one that the reception of the Spirit is not the same thing as the restoration of Israel. <clears throat> to where in the Old Testament you might get that impression. He says, no, kingdom is future, power of the age to come. The, the, the coming of the Spirit is something that's happening for us. But I do like your thing on death because it's very clear that the resurrection of, of everybody is supposed to happen at the end of history. But that happened 2,000 years ago in the middle of history with Jesus. But there, Christians are very clear to say that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. More people are coming. Or he's the first fruits of the resurrection. He's just number one of a bunch of other people that are coming. What do you think? Um, God promised uh, Israel and his people uh, the Messiah, a Savior. Okay. Uh, around 18, 18. And so, since David didn't fulfill Psalm 16 or Psalm 110, okay. um, but Jesus did. Okay. So that shows God was working through Jesus, and Jesus really was who said he was. Okay, okay, so, I like that. Wait, yeah. kind of said I was going to say, basically, you call, so you're saying this guy's the presence of life, and the Christ is supposed to be the one who came to the kingdom? Right. And it's inaugurated, or the through whom God inaugurated? Yeah. So then just by mentioning, hey, Christ is here and alive, the kingdom is soon to come. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Obviously, God is working through this person. It is extremely important, and you will spend the rest of your life in your ministries teaching people that Christ is not Jesus' last name. He's not the son <laughs> of Mary and Joseph Christ. His middle name is not H. He's not Jesus H. Christ. Okay? Uh, Christ is a title meaning the anointed king of the kingdom. Okay? Christ was actually, it's a, it's a Greek word that would have made no sense to Greeks. It's, it's a word that came over in the Septuagint to translate Mashiach, to translate Messiah. They had to explain, when Paul's going around saying Jesus is the Christ, he had to explain what that title meant. It wasn't something in the vocabulary of a normal Greek or Roman. Why don't okay? you translate it into English? I don't forget it. Doesn't that make people in English too when they have anointed it? That. Yeah, I, and actually, you could uh, you could translate where it says Jesus Christ, you could put King Jesus, and that would be a fair representation of what the text means. And people would understand that hopefully better. There are a lot of people that believe that Jesus is the Christ, but they have no idea what Christ means, which is, is troublesome. Anyone else want to make any comments on, on, the, on the kingdom? Uh, whenever it gets my heart about all of this, he, yeah. he made the, you know, he has a historical perspective in writing a commentary. Yeah. Historical perspective in Joel is the southern kingdom and how Joel is prophesying about the southern kingdom, but also in the future. Yes. Um, which it kind of compares to what Peter is saying, because Peter is saying, you know, sons and daughters shall prophesy, and, and that has been fulfilled every day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the repentance flavor that that also is in Joel with with comparing it to the last day is that people will be asked to repent and therefore whenever that happens with the spirit being present that it's also not just in Joel or in the southern kingdom times but it's also now thing where the, the kingdom is now and the kingdom is coming and you need to repent and, and uh, by doing that you will receive the Holy Spirit and you, you may comment that that doesn't always mean the kingdom yeah. you know, the spirit is the kingdom but I feel like that is a 
really, really big concept or idea or uh, emphasis to put. It. Like, the kingdom is a spirit also. Like, yeah. Not nice. just a spirit, but, yeah. Yeah. So what the clear that when he, uh, Jesse said was, what well, my attention to concerning the kingdom was several things where um, Peter had spoke about the, uh, the coming of God, he spoke about the signs and love and light and yep. in the dark. That's, that's the indication the kingdom is coming. Yep. It also speaks about, you know, God being on, or Jesus being on God's right hand side. That speaks about the being of the kingdom. So, yep. and also, coming on repentance, I mean, what better way to get to the kingdom than to repent? Absolutely. Also, Several little key points that I saw in the passage that, that, that just screamed in the kingdom so much, but he said it didn't say it in about a word, but you got to somewhat uh, differentiate, you know, pretty much. A lot of theology. Right, exactly. Okay. I feel really good because the evidence that I think indicates that he is preaching the kingdom is not was not mentioned by anybody. Okay? Uh, you know, how many of you know sort of what 2 Samuel 7 describes? <clears throat> 2 Samuel 7 is, uh, is God speaking uh, through the prophet Nathan. He's talking to King David about his son. And God says through Nathan, Nathan's talking, but God's talking through Nathan to David. He says, he says to, to David, um, when your days are complete, when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. He's going to come forth from you. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom and your throne will be established forever. Okay? The fact that there is a descendant of David implies the king of the kingdom of God. That is explicitly mentioned in verse 30 when he quotes Psalm 132 where it says that David talked about as a prophet that God has sworn to him with an oath that one of his descendants will sit on his throne. The throne of David is the kingdom throne that is yet to be established. Okay? To me, that is the biggest piece of evidence that kingdom of God theology is spoken of. The other evidence is, is what is said in verse uh, 36, that after the resurrection, obviously we haven't gotten that far, but after the resurrection, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Messiah. Messiah. Okay, God has made him the Messiah. Okay? And he is the one that is the promised descendant of David that's going to rule on David's throne. That's the kingdom of God right there. All the things that you said are all true. But to me, that is the biggest piece of evidence right there. Whenever I see this Davidic throne, Davidic kingdom theology, son of David uh, theology, that implies kingdom of God. That is so important. The thing is, uh, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we don't think about all Psalm 102. We think of like Psalm 2 or 2 Samuel 7. You know, we think of those major passages. Psalm 132, I bet that was never one of your memory verses growing up. Go read Psalm 132. There's a ton of like Davidic throne kingdom stuff in that passage. So I, I feel really good about that. All right. So let's move on a little bit more. Now we got to pick up the pace a little bit. There's so much neat stuff in here. I'm glad that we're having some good interaction and hope you guys are benefiting from uh, everyone's input. All right, Psalm 110, the second psalm, it's cited to indicate that David looked forward to his superior being exalted at God's right hand. Why do I think that? Because uh, verse 34, it was not David who ascended to heaven, but he himself says, who's he? David. David. David said, Yahweh said to my Lord, who, who is the my there? David's Lord. David is claiming to have a superior person. He says, Yahweh says to my Lord, David the king, is talking about somebody else, even though Psalm 110 says it's a psalm of David. There might have been some Jews who thought this referred to David in some strange way. No one thought that David had sent to heaven. There are no Jewish traditions about that. They did think that some, some Hellenistic Jews did think that some famous Jewish figures had been exalted to heaven in some sense. But they, they never thought about that of David. But David thought that there was a superior person who was going to sit at God's right hand in vindication until he comes and subdues his enemies. The my Lord indicates that David had a Lord, David's Lord. Uh, if you took any of Anthony's classes, this is all like common stock to you. Uh, the Hebrew here, the word Adonim, is used in all of its 195 occurrences. I've looked up every one of them. To refer to an exalted figure, it never refers to Yahweh. So when you have Yahweh speaking to my Lord, you have Yahweh speaking to an exalted figure. Uh, the my Lord figure is distinguished from the, the Lord, Yahweh. It's pretty clear in the passage at the beginning of the verse. So, of course, the passage at the end of Psalm 110, one, where it says, Until I make your enemies your footstool, it continues to emphasize Luke's not yet eschatology. 
Remember the already and the not yet? The already is that Jesus has been raised from the dead. The Spirit has been poured out. The, the Gentiles are coming in. Forgiveness of sins is taking place. The not yet is that the kingdom is not yet consummated. Jesus has not returned. Resurrection of everybody hasn't happened yet. There's already a not yet. The, the overlap of the ages. You heard 1 verse 6. Is this at the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still they're waiting for this time when until I make your enemies your footstool. He's got a good balance. Look, there's a good balance between already, already fulfilled and not yet fulfilled. Are you familiar with this terminology, the already and not yet? Heard that before? Okay. All right. Uh, Peter concludes the speech by result, uh, resulting that God has made this Jesus, both Lord, the Lord according to Psalm 110.1, by the way. Lord is defined by Psalm 110.1. And Christ, according to Psalm 132, 2 Samuel 7, etc. All right. Luke, however, has already alerted the readers to this truth in Luke chapter 2.11. Where it says, uh, Luke 2 11 is talking about the birth of Jesus, where the one being born is called the Lord Messiah. Actually, it takes both of those terms, the Lord Christ, the Lord Messiah, and puts them together at Jesus' birth. Okay? So Luke has already told the readers this. It's not like, oh wow, surprising, I didn't know that. Like, obviously, the readers knew this, but from the perspective of, of the crowds and the audience, they didn't know this. This Jesus was the one the house of Israel collectively and blamed to be crucified. That's what he says there in 36. Um, but all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Like, let's stick to him. So, it's interesting in preaching that, by the way, Peter, does he like kind of dance around the issue of sin a little bit? No, How many pastors do that? Oh, well, you guys kind of make some mistakes and God will forgive you. Now, hey, you guys killed Jesus. You crucified Jesus. And he's honest with them. And how did they respond? How did the people respond? What does the next verse say? They were pierced the heart because you told them that they, they sinned. Let me tell you, this is a pastoral point. You've got to be honest and clear and deliberate when you're preaching about the seriousness of sin. Otherwise, it's not going to pierce people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Step off some thoughts. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. The audience, by the way, is humbled by the preaching. They ask in regard to the proper response. What are we supposed to do? That's what it says in verse 37. What shall we do? Peter commands them to both repent and to be baptized. Obviously, it's baptism in water, but that's what happened. And notice they are to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That's what you want to underline in your Bible. How do they get the forgiveness of sins? According to Peter, they need to repent and be baptized. Okay? And then they will receive the portion of the promised spirit. Note carefully that there is no forgiveness without repentance and water baptism, according to Luke 2.38. That will preach. That won't be very popular, but that will preach. What exactly is repentance? Uh, changing your mind, literally. Like, stop thinking and acting and, and, and doing certain things and to change the way that you think and act in the present. Uh, the, the Greek verb is metanoeo, which just means to change your mind. Change the way you think, you'll change the way you act. All right, verse 39, in the quotation. Remember, I told you that Joel 2 had a long quotation, and then it got kind of temporarily suspended, and it gets picked back up in verse 39. You don't see this very well, because normally in the NASB, yeah, they go back to block quote. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they block quote everything. They don't do it here in verse 39, but your, your footnotes will tell you Joel 2, 32 there. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off. Who is you and your children? When you speak into the Jews. Who's, who's you and your children? Easy answer. Yeah, okay. Who are those who are far off? The Gentiles, the Gentiles okay? By the way, um, there, uh, there's a, the, the, those who are far off, it might be actually be a reference to Isaiah 57, verse 19, where uh, the promise is that God will eventually reveal his glory to those who are far off. Um, you can look at the Septuagint and see how it's used there. Uh, it's not a big deal, but uh, there might be an illusion there that those who are far off. And of course, um, if you go back, by the way, if you look at your chart, I want to look at the chart that has the, uh, the quotations, the, the Joel and the Acts quotations. Okay. This one right here, where it talks about uh, how the Lord has called certain people, he has announced to certain people, 
Um, and the Lord our God is going to call people, but the interesting thing is that the Septuagint here talks about the good news. And of course, what did he just do? He just preached the good news to people. So there's a, there's a gospel sort of relation, which is why he felt the need to use this in the context of preaching the gospel and put this around that particular time period. He couldn't announce repentance and baptism at just describing these things. He had to say, Jesus is the one that was proph prophesied in Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. You killed him, he's been raised from the dead, we're witnesses of these things. What is the, the, the number of the slide that we're on right now, by the way? Okay, I think it's it. There we go. All right. Um, the remaining preaching is summarized by the continual exhortation to be saved from this crooked generation. It's a similar phrase that's used in Deuteronomy 37. By the way, what is the opposite of crooked? Straight. straight. Okay. For Luke, the way of the Lord is to be made straight in Luke chapter 3 and verse 5. And also, we're going to see it also in Acts chapter 13 and verse 10. Okay. Um, so, if you're going to summarize verses 14 through 40, I mean, which is a lot, <laughs> my best attempt at summarizing is that Luke 14, or 2, 14 through 40, records Peter's sermon, which highlights the death and resurrection of King Jesus, ultimately leading to many being baptized into the new covenant community. That's what happens to people. So, I'm trying to summarize the passage. There we go. Okay. Now, I have found in the next section, we're in verses 41 through 47, which is kind of like what, what the community is like. It's the life of the empowered community. I found another chiasm. Guess what? Verse 41. There's effective evangelism through preaching. Down here, effective evangelism through lifestyle. B, shared worship and meals. B, prime, shared worship and meals. C, shared possessions. Another chiasm. And that indicates that there is a... Uh, there's an organized structure within this. It wasn't just like haphazardly, I'm just going to write something and throw it all out there. There's some intelligence that's going on behind this. Unfortunately, 99% of readers will never perceive these, this organization here. Okay, um, let's talk about the baptisms and the seriousness of the baptisms. Okay, 3,000 people get baptized that day. They respond. They get baptized in water. All right? By the way, when it says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and then you will receive the Holy Spirit. Repent and get baptized, then you will receive the Holy Spirit. Can this baptism be spirit baptism? No. No, it's differentiated from the reception of the Spirit. Okay? And it's obvious in the context that baptism means water baptism. The word baptizo means to dunk in water. If you wash your hands, you're baptizing your hands. Okay? I know we don't struggle with this, but there are a lot of people out there that think that baptism doesn't mean water baptism. It's, it's ridiculous. The argument you have to make. I think the text is pretty clear. All right. Without a major river near Jerusalem, the various mikvahot. A mikvah is a uh, an immersion pool. The mikvahot is the uh, plural of it, the Hebrew. Within the city would plausibly allow for the 3,000 baptisms to occur over a period of a few hours. I, th I think in your mind, you probably have this idea that they all kind of go up to a river. There's no river there. Like most of these, these mikvah. Were, were filled with, with rainwater. Um, over 150, 150 uh, mikvahs have been excavated in the city of Jerusalem. The number 3,000, by the way, is probably a Lucan approximation. I mean, exactly 3,000, really? Exactly? That's a nice round number. It's just probably like, hey, there's probably around 3,000. Okay. So, wait, I have a question. So, are they using like all 150, or are they just like using one? Or like, we, all we know is what it says. If I had to guess, it's probably like, hey, 250 of you guys, you go with Andrew. 250 of you guys, you go with James. 250 of you guys, you go with John. 250 of you guys, you go with Peter. Go to these various places. We'll get it all done. I mean, that's that's historically more realistic than... Are you using the same one? Huh? Are you using the same one? Well, I mean, this, this, is, this is in the middle of a festival where there's, no, there's a million people in the city. Yeah. Like, you can't just take 3,000 people into this temple and start doing that stuff. So, so would would you think that you know after John or whoever baptized like ten people, do you think those ten people could turn around and start baptizing themselves? I think so. I no. think so. Uh, I think that it would have been done a lot faster if that would happen. It would. It would. I mean, just philosophically, this is how it would have turned out. 
And let me ask you this. Let's say you were on a desert island. You and a bunch of friends, and the Bible came to shore. You read the Bible, and you wanted to convert to Christianity. Um, who would do the baptizing? Water? No, who, who would do the baptizing? The yes, it, it, it would be acceptable in those conditions to baptize yourself. So, and we do have evidence of that happening in, in church history. I know people don't like that because for some reason they think that that's impossible, but I think that's within the sense of, of what baptism is trying to convey. So, who would get your friend to baptize you? I'm sorry? So, you, when you say baptize yourself, would it matter whether you do that yourself or your friend does it? Or I mean, yeah. 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 Can you be a non-believer and be back to the exact question almost? Like, it's no. A non-believer. You know, I shouldn't have even brought it up. Yeah. I, shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> I was just saying that if you were on a desert island and there was nobody there to baptize you and you converted to the faith, I think it would be okay for you to baptize yourself. That's it. So, that's, that's awesome. Anyway, I shouldn't have brought it up. All right. So, um, I, I'm guessing 3,000 is probably a nice round number of guessing how many people were there. Um, by the way, it was only after the people accepted the word, what is the word in the New Testament? Gospel, Gospel message, okay? That they were baptized and that they were added to their numbers. How can you be added to their numbers? You have to repent, accept the word, and get baptized. Use a very specific language there. All right. Now, I do want to make this caveat right here. Although it's popular for preachers to teach, Acts 2, 41 to 47, as a model for Christian church. There are too many details that can't be reproduced. We already talked about this. The book of Acts was not written for you to emulate as a model for the church. It's a schematized, organized account of how the gospel went to Rome. Okay? So let's just look at these. First of all, there are already apostles today in the sense of the twelve. Okay? Sharing all things is impossible. You mean just really sharing everything? I'm wearing Callum's underwear today. Like, it's just, that's impossible. We just don't do that, all right? Selling the property and their possessions, that's a distinctly Lucan category, okay? Luke has a theology of the selling and giving of possessions. They did this around the temple. They did it in the temple. The temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD. How are you going to go baptize people in the temple uh, immersion pools when the temple's not even there anymore? And breaking bread from house to house, like, really? Are we going to do this with our churches? Like, it's just like, there's a sense, in the, like, okay, what the sense that we can get out of it? They operated as a community. They took care of each other. Um, they, they were, the people who were baptized were initiated into a community, and they actually, they weren't like, oh, they were baptized, and they kind of like went off and lived their own lives. No, they, they, they were invested in this new covenant community. So, I just did, those are some things to think about in regard to uh, application. Also this, the selling of property and possessions. Um, we see right there. See verse 45? They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So I put that there. Selling your property and possessions was never intended to be a blanket statement for all believers to rid themselves of every single earthly possession. I, I know this is true because when you read this verse, you don't feel convicted to go sell your car and, and your house and give it to the poor. So I know you believe this, okay? All right, so how do we know this? They were selling and they were sharing, and it's very clear there, as anyone might have need. Did every single person sell their house? No. But if there was a need that arose, if someone had extra, they would make sure those needs were being taken care of. Okay? How could they meet in homes if all their homes were sold? Okay? How could they gather in house churches if all their churches were, all their houses were sold? Okay? Look, nowhere gives, by the way, and look, nowhere gives the impression that all possessions are evil. Like, possessions are bad, and stuff is bad, and you should just get rid of all of it. That's a Gnostic theology that, that, that creation is, is evil. Um, and the disciples, they consider themselves within the New Covenant, the New Covenant community. Um, but the interesting thing is that they nevertheless continue to meet in the temple. Okay? You would think to yourself, oh, we've got all these letters of Paul. We know that once you become a Christian, you are not bound to, um, to Judaism anymore. They actually thought of themselves as, as still Jews, as still an extension of Judaism, as the fulfillment of Judaism. Herod's temple, by the way, uh, is massive. It covers 35 acres or 1.5 million square feet. Tier of glory. Yeah. <laughs> it's a massive, massive temple. I mean, it's, I, I wish I could, you know, we're talking multiple football fields long. You know. We're building that new warehouse in the uh, Avalon right here. 
that's only 715,000 square feet. Yeah. So like 1.5 million square feet. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's massive. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's hard to appreciate it because we just have this little tiny square in, in the maps in the back of our Bibles. <laughs> like this is a massive structure. Okay. You can hold lots of people on this thing. All right, there's no indication that the disciples continue to offer sacrifices, at least for any sort of ritual significance. So that's something interesting there. Okay, now we can move on to chapter 3, which is less complicated, and uh, <clears throat> do my best to get through this information here. Uh, chapter 2 is obviously much more massive. Chapter 3, I'm going to argue 3 verses 1 through the end of chapter 4 is all one big story, but since we're doing chapters 2 and 3 today, we're only going to get half the story. So stay tuned for next week. Or I'll start off and I'll say, last week, our heroes. <laughs> All right. So this episode begins by describing how Peter and John, John doesn't say a word, regularly went into the temple at the ninth hour for prayer. Okay? And it says that they met this guy at the beautiful gate. It's likely something called the Nicanor Gate, which is this gate right here. Actually, and this should be like shifted a little bit here because this northern gate should actually be facing north. But it's this huge gate right here. Um, this is kind of like the inner temple, this is the, the, the outer courts. Um, and it's this big massive gate. Uh, it was covered with gold. It was the largest of the temple gates. Um, outside of the Book of, Act, Book of Acts, we have no reference to a beautiful gate. So just, we're making an intelligent guess. So I know you're all worried about that detail. So now you can rest the least here. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, the temple gates, they were, they were common hot spots for beggars. Why? Because lots of people are going through them. You know, that's why people that are beggars, where do they go? The hot spots of travel, which are the intersections. All right? Uh, the rabbis, they considered it shameful to be dependent on the charitable alms of others. And they taught this regularly. It actually would avoid the abuse of the system. It was, it was not a, I mean, it was really shameful for you to have to ask for money. I think people sometimes today, uh, they feel that. They, they have a hard time asking for help because they know they feel shame. Okay, so we see this account, the miraculous account is emphasized with the healing of a man walking. And he is described as walking four times in the passage. That's a lot. That's emphatic. Okay? He's walking, he's walking, he's walking, he's walking. And originally the lame man had to be carried. How lame? All right. Peter did not draw, really? Okay, all right. Peter did not draw the crowd unto him. So remember, he was this lame man. Um, he asked Peter for money. He's like, I don't have any money to give you, by the way, but uh, I have something better. I have like wholeness and life and restoration. Um, and so he's able to heal him in the name of Jesus. Okay? And, the, and, the, and the, the guy gets up and he's walking. He's making this huge commotion. And people are looking and they're like, uh, we know this guy because he's been laying his entire life. And we see him in the temple a lot. Now he's walking. He creates a commotion. Peter didn't draw the crowd to him. He only began to preach when he saw the reaction to the man who was healed. But so like the apostles have power for these sort of incentives to Jesus. We, we, we get that sense. We get that sense. But we see that... Um, that they don't attribute to them because they don't... Hold yeah, this. it's definitely not like their own abilities. They're being empowered by either God or by the risen Jesus, which in a sense is kind of the same power source, or at least direction. Okay, so they go and they meet in Solomon's portico. It's also mentioned in John chapter 10. It's located on the southeastern corner of the temple. It has two massive columns. Um, since uh, this, this actually this, this colonnade, it actually predated Herod's beautification of the temple. Some people assume that it was derived from the time of Solomon. Solomon was the builder of the original temple. That's her, how it got his name. Now you know. Next time you're in Jeopardy, you'll get that question right. <coughs> All right. First order of business in Peter's temple sermon is to draw attention away from him and from John. What's the first thing that he says uh, in this sermon? Look here in chapter 3. <coughs> 3 verse 12, when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, notice how he designates them as, as men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze on us as if by our own power of piety we made him walk? He's very clear to not draw attention to himself. Let me tell you, there's a lot of temptation with teachers and preachers to want to put the attention on them. He's like, look, I didn't do this. Someone worked through me. And it's, it's, it's an interesting, humble perspective. They are not the performance of the miracle, rather the God of the fathers has glorified Jesus, and it was on the basis of Jesus' name that the man was healed. Notice, by the way, that they still have the same God. After they became Christian, they still believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is someone who is distinguished from this Jesus. 
Okay, God has glorified, what verse is this? I think this is 15, 16, 13. God has glorified his servant Jesus. This word for servant, uh, uh, pega, is, is a, an ambiguous word. It could mean child or servant. And you'll see if you have footnotes that will tell you that. Um, and I think that he's actually making a reference to Isaiah 52, verse 13. Isaiah 52, 13, and 2, which it says, Behold, my servant will understand. He will be exalted. He will be glorified exceedingly. So he's got my servant in glorification. Same Greek words are used here. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God of Paul says, Glorify his servant Jesus, who, by the way, you delivered over. That handing over is also used in Isaiah 53. So it's interesting. He's got an Isaiah 53, 52, 53, uh, suffering servant theology in his preaching. Um, and he mentions Pilate, by the way. Okay? Not the guy that, uh, that controls your airplane. Punches Pilate. <clears throat> Where is he? He is... Verse 13. Alright. The one whom you delivered this only in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. That's an interesting detail there. <clears throat> Pilate is not ultimately guilty. He might be guilty by association. Pilate wanted to release him, but he was pressured by the Jews to... Uh, to crucify Jesus. Remember that, that story? Yeah. Kind of like saying, like, even the Greek pilot is more, is better off than you are, more righteous than you are in this case. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's making sure the blame goes on the right people. So, <laughs> yeah. Pilate is mentioned here as the one who wanted to release Jesus against the wishes of the Jewish people present. It was common, by the way, for Roman officials to defer to local customs in forgiving offenses. Okay, so, yeah, they want to. Pilate has two jobs as, as a Roman governor, to keep the peace and to collect the taxes. And, and if, if releasing somebody will keep the peace and they can look good in the eyes of his, uh, his superiors, um, that's good. Who was the emperor during the, uh, the reign of uh, uh, Pilate? Tiberius. Huh? Tiberius. Tiberius. Uh, Jesus is described here as the Holy and Righteous One in 3.14, a title that is not used of anyone else in Scripture. Uh, the way the Righteous One is, however, a title used in Isaiah 53. He's also the Prince of Life, using a phrase for a prince, which is rare. It's a debated New Testament word. We're not going to get into it all. It's used twice in Acts and twice in the book of Hebrews. Um, sometimes people think it's the pioneer or the founder, but it's used in the Septuagint of great leaders like Moses. Pioneer, prince, ruler. It actually shares the same semantical value of the word archon, which means ruler. It's just an interesting point there. Okay, let's talk about the name of Jesus. I think this is really important here. Because I'm always interested in, in if the message of the kingdom is preached in, in these sermons. Um, where is this? What verse is this? 16. Yes. Uh, on the basis of faith in his name, that is the name of Jesus. What is the name of Jesus? Does that just mean like J-E-S-U-S, -S, his name, like my name is Dustin, your name is Nathan? Um, we see here, this is one of the, the parallel accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's easy to, to, to remember if you want to teach this to people because they all end in 29s. So all you have to remember is 19, 10, 18. All right, Matthew says, everyone that's left houses for brothers and sisters and father, mother, and children, farms, for my name's sake will receive many times as much. My name's sake. Mark, the original one, since we release all these things for my sake and for the gospel's sake. So that just got changed to Matthew for my sake. And Luke said for the sake of the kingdom of God. So notice the name of Jesus is the same thing as Jesus' gospel. And it's the same thing as the kingdom of God in Luke. So Luke, if Luke was to understand for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of his name, could that not mean for the sake of Jesus' message of the kingdom? I think, I think a good argument could be made there. You see what I did there? I took, I took the theology of why Matthew and Luke redacted Mark. Let me, let me kind of pull the questions today because I'm running out of time here. All right, so therefore, the name of Jesus, I think you can make the argument, reads the gospel message. Okay, they did it on the basis of Jesus' name, everything that he stands for. What does Jesus stand for? He stands for his message. And the message that Jesus preached in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the message of the kingdom of God. Therefore, the summarized sermon implicitly offers the message of the kingdom of God here. You know, you may take, take that or leave it, whatever you want. Um, okay, 319-21 is the most important passage um, in this chapter, which says this, Therefore, repent and return, so that, purpose statement, your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, 
about which God spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets in the ancient times. We are, why is Jesus in heaven? He is waiting until the time of the restoration of all things. So obviously, that's the not yet part. Yeah. Okay, that is obviously an unfulfilled, not yet part. The restoration of all the things spoken of in all the prophets. That's a big kingdom of God passage. Okay, by the way, the repentance there, he says, um, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, that echoes 238. He doesn't mention baptism, but obviously that would imply baptism. People don't get baptized on this account because it's not, this account does not concern the, the crowds. It just concerns the preaching and how Peter gets put in jail for preaching. So we actually don't see what happens with people. Uh, Jesus is currently in heaven until the restoration of all things, which is mentioned in the prophets. Okay, last slide here. Man, this is like a marathon. All right. All right, the Christological emphasis continues by citing Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19. Look at what he does here. Go to the, the Old Testament, verse 22. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like me, Moses, from your brethren. You want to underline that part, from your brethren. To him shall... Uh, to him you shall give heed to everything that he says to you, and it will be that every soul that does not give heed to that prophet shall utterly be destroyed among the people. Okay, that's actually what verse 19 says. It doesn't get, uh, you don't see the end. You have to go back to Deuteronomy 18 to see that. Okay, by the way, God is going to, it's important for us to understand that when he says uh, God will raise up, that means that God is going to put this figure on the scene of history, okay? I know it's the same word for resurrection. But in Deuteronomy, it just means that God is going to raise him a prophet. He's going to put him on the scene. Okay? And by the way, since he has to be someone from among their brethren, this prophet has to be someone from among the Israelites, Jesus had to be a legitimate Israelite in order to fit this description. If Jesus was, hypothetically, an angel from heaven who came down to earth, he could not fit this description because he was not an Israelite from among their brethren. You see that? That's, that's a Christological distinction that defines um, who that person is. All right? The citation of Deuteronomy 18 allows Peter to draw attention to Jesus' authority, which is bound within his words. Notice he says, whoever doesn't listen to him um, will utterly be destroyed among the people. You better listen to this person. He's a prophet. You've got to listen to him. So they've got to listen to Jesus. They are still concerned with listening to the teachings of Jesus. The next citation that they have is from uh, Genesis 12, 3. You know, Genesis 12. Um, is about uh, the calling of Abram that he's going to be used, the vessel through whom God's blessing is going to go to the entire world. 